There's such a sweet presence this morning. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to the throne of God. God is so good, isn't he? Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5? Matthew chapter 5, as we continue the Beatitudes, beginning with verse 1, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord God, for your blessing and anointing, Lord God, on your word. We thank you for these beatitudes, Lord God, which continue to infuse us, Lord God, and to teach us the ways that we should live, addressing the issues that we have. Father, we thank you so much, Lord God. We ask, Father, that in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would touch us as we continue this study, Lord God. And Father, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts and minds and that our ways would line up with your ways. Thank you for all that you teach us. Thank you, even when you rebuke us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the discipline that you instill in us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy and grace. And Father, as we are here today, Lord God, we just want to glean all that you have for us. And for everything that is said and done, may you and you alone receive all praise, glory, and honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and everybody said, Amen. before you see, you look to someone and say, I'm a peacemaker. You may be seated. As we're working through the Beatitudes, just want to let you know as well, pro uh, next week I will be ending them. I'll be covering a couple of them together. Uh, but today, this beatitude is in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Much of the beatitudes just fly in the face of what we have been taught in this world even what we have come to believe. You can see why Jesus just came up against so many things. This seems harmless. Yeah, blessed are the peacemakers. Unless you were living in Palestine in the days of Jesus, under Roman occupation. Very interesting thing, isn't it? You know, because he's sitting there, they're under Roman occupation, Romans around, they're under this kind of uh, brutality. They understand the law of the Romans. And they wanted them gone. In fact, they were looking for a Messiah, a Savior. They really thought that there was going to be a Savior that would deliver them from the Romans. And here you have the Savior there telling them to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Not a popular message, is it? 
It's interesting because even today, being a peacemaker isn't always as popular. Sometimes we feel we have to give back what, what we have received. Sometimes we need to feel that we have to take or exact revenge. Sometimes we feel we have to match the attitude that's coming our way. If there are people that are just in our face, if there's people that get ugly with us, we feel like we gotta get ugly with them. And all we end up doing is escalating the issue rather than trying to back off. And we see this so much, you know, in the world today. So many people, events and things in our lives try to rob us of peace. It seems that the world is getting more violent and the love of most growing colder. This is the world that we seem to be living in. No wonder the world is crying out for peace. It is a biblical concept, peace, and yet, interestingly enough, as much as the world will cry out for peace, in the midst of wars, there will rise up someone that will offer them peace, the Antichrist. And I find it interesting that they would want to receive that kind of peace than what God has to offer. One of the reasons why this is such an important message of Jesus, because it speaks to us that, hey, listen, there's going to be a time when someone is going to give peace in this world. There's going to be an era of peace in this world for three and a half years. It'll be noted because Israel will be in on that peace, and yet it won't be the peace of God. We have to understand what the peace of God is. One of the things is you can't be a peacemaker if you don't understand biblical peace. Or you'll be making peace with everything and anyone, and is that what God wants? Is that what God is saying here through Jesus? So first of all, let's take a look at what biblical peace is. Biblical peace begins first and foremost with God. You cannot have peace without God. In Job 22, 21, it says this, Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Make peace with God. Submit to God and make peace. In Romans 8, 6, it says this, The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. And so if we're going to start with peace, where it is, where it comes from, we've got to understand that it comes from God. God is the one who authors peace. He's the one that gives peace. True peace can be found in Jesus. I know, like, I, I feel like I'm ending my message right now. Trust me, I'm not. Maybe I should, right? Ephesians 2.14 says this, For he himself is our peace. So it begins with God. It continues through his son, who is God incarnate. And what Jesus begins, if, if it says that for he himself is our peace, take a look what Jesus has to say about himself and peace in John 14, 27. It says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. It's interesting. In other words, Jesus is making a clear distinction. The world's idea of peace is not my idea of peace. I'm not going to give you cheapened peace. I'm going to give you true peace. And so what is it that the world seems to have that's different from Jesus? The world's idea of peace is financial stability. The world's idea of peace is no wars, no arguments, no crime, no violence, neither spousal nor child abuse, no divorce, no stress. Continue on. Add to that list. But those are fruits of peace. It's not peace itself. I'm going to show you a picture. You take a look at this picture behind me. When you see it, you're taking a look at 
two chairs on a beach. Many would consider this to be, you know, man, that's my idea of peace. Hakuna Matata. Let me just lounge out and, you know, now if you know some of the commercials and things like that, <laughs> it'll be a nice beverage of Coca-Cola or something, you know. But anyway, you go on, you know, right? And, and so you just be laying out, lounging out. You've got your sombrero. You've got your shade. You're just sitting there and you're just watching the ocean, watching the clouds above. Many consider that peace. However, that is tranquil and that is serene. That is what we call peaceful. It's not peace. There is a difference. When something is peaceful, it doesn't mean it's necessarily the peace that you're supposed to have. See, one's external, the other is internal. And when Jesus is talking about the peace that you need to have, he's not talking about having financial stability. Although he wants you to have that, the Bible talks about you having that. That's not what he's referring to. He's referring to solely when he talks about blessed are the peacemakers. When he's referring to the word peace in there, he's talking to that inward peace. And if you don't understand that, then you can't be a true peacemaker. In John 16, it says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Again, Jesus makes a distinction between the peace he offers, between the trouble in the world. No matter what the world may offer you, will never be what God can offer you because it comes from within and so, what Jesus came to offer was true peace, not the world's idea of peace. The world's idea of peace has produced no more than 200 years since mankind has been on the planet of peace. And every single treaty that man has ever made, every single one of them, has been broken. See, Jesus came to offer true peace, not necessarily peacefulness. Here's some, of the ability, here's some of the things that true peace, that in, inner, internal peace gives you. Ability to sleep. I mean, that's priceless. For as much as I continue to get up in the middle of the night, getting a sound sleep is priceless. You know, every time I wake up, I always thank God for the sleep that I got. Because I know that if I'm going to be able to sleep, it comes from him. And so I thank him for the sleep I got, regardless. Because I'm thinking, hey, wow, you know, he gave me the sleep. True sleep, peaceful sleep. In Psalm 4.8, it says this, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And see, here's the thing. I, I love this. And much of what we see about peace, you'll see... When it talks about the blessings of peace, it's the Lord makes. Something that the Lord makes. Even the word peacemaker has make in it. Very interesting. And in here, it's the Lord that makes me dwell in safety. You know, he's the one that when we can sleep in peace. And, the re and there's a number of reasons for that, but I'm going to continue. Peace Number two, peace gives life to the body. In Proverbs 14.30, it says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. I mean, if we are envious of our neighbor, you're not going to have peace. If you're going to be envying after others, where's the peace? You know, you don't have it. You know, he says, hey, listen, a heart at peace, and in this particular passage, a heart at peace is one that doesn't envy what other people have. You live your life like that, and I guarantee you, you will never have peace. Why? Because you have to keep up with the Joneses. You have to keep up with the Ruggieros. I hate to keep throwing the Joneses out there. I don't know any Joneses, but hey. But you have to keep up with somebody. You know what I'm saying, right? And God is saying, listen, you know, envy will only rot your bones. Leave it alone. Be in peace. 
The peace of God will even have enemies living at peace with you in Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Think about that. When you know that, when your ways are pleasing, you're going to have that peace. When your ways are pleasing to God, he gives you a peace by making even your enemies live at peace with you. The peace of God acts like a guardian. In Philippians 4, 7, it says this, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. I don't know about you, but I need God guarding my heart and my mind all the time. I need it because I know when God is guarding my heart and my mind, I know that I'm at peace. He's going to keep out the bad thoughts that come in. He's going to keep out the anxiety that I may feel that causes my heart to race a little bit because he's guarding it. This is the peace of God, and it transcends all understanding. In other words, it, it, you, you could be looking at so many troubles in your life, things that don't make sense, and somehow you could be at peace. It's like, wow, you know what? I know I should be troubled, and I'm sure. I've talked to enough people that have experienced this in their lives. You know, they know that they got a mortgage payment. They know they just got bad news from the doctors, and wow, I, I, I thought I'd be more upset than this. And they realized something. It was the peace of God that was guarding their hearts and their minds, giving them that peace. Let me tell you something. Something else that peace does. You know, I, I, when, whenever I've counseled anyone, and if I've ever talked to you here or those who may be tuning in, and, and when you've had to make an important decision, one of the first questions I will ask you, if not the first, well, usually it's, have you talked to God? If you haven't, let's start there. If you need to make that decision. But then the next one, right after that, do you have a peace about it? What does it mean? It means that your spirit is at rest with the decision, one way or another. Whenever you have an unrest, you know that that's not the place you're going. There's a reason why. Even if it all makes sense, but you know that I just don't, I don't feel right about it. I just can't go forward. I've had to do that many times. And, it, you know, it, making a decision whether it be for the church, for my family, whatever it is. And I just could not do it because I did not have a peace. I remember, you know, uh, it was like uh, we were celebrating our one-year anniversary, Kathy and I. And we were in Florida. <clears throat> And we decided to stay at a hotel uh, in Orlando. And when we got there, you know, that hotel, when we chose, it was like $25. It was $27 for the night. It was incredible. No, I'm not that old, but I am old enough. And I hear $27 for the night. They were just bringing people in. What I didn't realize is, is that when we got there, we were checking out. We're supposed to get, you know, a complimentary breakfast, you know, so I go in there, and we're going to go, we're checking out, and going to go get breakfast, and as we go to check out, there was someone behind the desk, never once said that he wasn't a part of the hotel, he just kept saying, you know, uh, you know, that he was checking me out, he took my keys, he told the guy over, the, over at the computer, you know, they're checking out, he did whatever, and asked me, if, uh, you know, we wanted to sit down, talk over a different breakfast, it's uh, just about a mile away, and in that breakfast, you know, just to share with you a new hotel that's opening up, and uh, if you like, <laughs> you know where I'm going with it, it was a timeshare. Now, I didn't know anything about timeshares then, know a lot about them now, and I remember going there, Kathy and I said, okay, wow, make a quick 50 bucks and get breakfast. So we go there, and as soon as we sit down to eat breakfast, a gentleman comes and sits down. Now, he's not eating with us, but he's talking to us. We thought we were going to have a peaceful breakfast, you know, and now we have to answer all these questions with a stranger we're having breakfast with. Okay. And he just continued. One thing after another, 
And they almost had us signing that offer. In fact, I started, they, they, and you, the pressure is always great, right? They go around, they ring the bell. Yeah, let's welcome the Ruggieros to our family. You know, I haven't done anything yet. You know, they just brought over a document, and I'm supposed to sign it. And then I asked, I said, wow, this is really thick. I would like to take it home to read it. Oh, we don't allow these contracts to be taken out of here. What? But don't worry, just sign it, and you got three days. You, if you don't feel good about it, you can always. So I can't sit there and sign. So Kathy and I begin to read it. It was like 50 pages. At the end, I started skipping it, and I started to fill it out. And all of a sudden, this unrest. I was in the middle, I was about to sign my name, and I couldn't do it. This huge check. I mean, I, was, I felt immobilized. Kathy looks at me and like, she's saying, what's wrong? What, what, what are you feeling? What, what's going on? Why aren't you signing your name? You know, it was awkward because I just sat there staring. And then after several moments, I looked at her and said, I, I can't do this. Man, we were their best friend. Welcome into the family. When I put the pen down and I said, I can't do this and walk away, <laughs> I was like, okay, here's the door. We were by ourselves trying to figure out how to get out of that place, you know. It was amazing. But they did honor it, and I got the $50. But we both felt in our hearts there was just an unrest. There was no peace of God. Without having the peace of God in our lives, that spared us. That saved us. I mean, we were just one year into, you know, our marriage, and we didn't have $10,000 and this lifelong commitment without even being able to read this. We were just going to put ourselves in the debt for what reason? It didn't make sense at the time. You get caught up in all this pressure and things like that. Let me tell you, the peace of God will save you from making bad mistakes. If you listen, I was ignoring almost all the way up until the end. And I'm so glad I listened. I did not have that peace. But the peace of God will help you make those decisions. The peace of God will help you to stand firm. In Ephesians 6, 14 and 15, it says, Stand firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from what? The gospel of peace. When everything else is going down around you, it is the gospel of peace that keeps you standing firm, firmly planted on the rock. The devil will come and try to confuse you. He will try to condemn you. He will try to attack your health, your finances, and if possible, make you even question your salvation and God himself. That's what the enemy tries to do. And in those things, I have yet to find anyone who was at peace with the decision, I am walking away with, from God. It's usually almost like a pity party or a temper tantrum. But they never did it having peace. Yeah, you know what? I feel really good about this decision. To just walk away from God. No. Because they know there's something seriously wrong. If they know scripture at all, they could try to say, I no longer believe it. But I have yet to ask someone that question if they have peace. As they are walking away from God. To ever hear them say, yeah, I got great peace. This is the best thing ever happened to me. No. But I do see just the opposite. When they have come to the Lord, they have said, this is the best thing that has ever happened to me. They could be weeping and crying at the, at the altar and just, just tears just flowing down. And at the same time, what's happening? They have a peace. And no matter what they're going through, God's going to take care of it. This is how you are able to stand. However, there are things that will try, that will rob you of peace. And it can seem like you're maybe standing in quicksand and not on a rock. And the first thing is that sin will rob us of peace. In Psalm 38.3 it says this, Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. 
There is no soundness. Inner peace, it does not exist if you are trying to you know, hold on to sin in your life. Why is that? Because constantly we are battling the very thing. We're battling the very thing that gives us peace. We're battling God himself. And we, if we are having and harboring sin, if we're tempted, or the temptation isn't the problem. It is giving into it. You can be tempted. Yes, it may seem like tumultuous for a little bit, but you'll be okay if you rebuke the temptation. But if you sit there and try to justify the sin in your life, all you're doing is battling against God. And it will not work. You cannot have peace when you are in, in, you know, in a battle against the one who gives you peace. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work. Worry will rob you of peace. In Matthew 6.34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? I read that, and that is like something that just speaks to me every single time I read it. You know? In other words, just take one day at a time, but if you allow worry to come in, you will not have peace. Let me ask you, anyone here, by worrying about anything, have you really had peace when you are worrying? And you, 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 I guarantee you, I won't see one hand. Yeah, I'm worrying up all night. I'm worrying up all night long. <laughs> I got peace. No, you can't do that. Worry will rob you of peace. Ro- you know, you rob you of the sleep. You just can't do it. Because you're always thinking about what might be. And you're not trusting God to take care of you. And you know, worry, I love the definition for worry. It's to torment oneself with or from disturbing thoughts. That's what you're doing, tormenting yourself with trouble or disturbing thoughts. Isaiah 26.3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How can you worry when you're trusting God? And it didn't say that he's just going to give you peace. He said, no, perfect peace. That is the promise that is there. Worry is actually a compound word. It means to divide the mind. And it's exactly what happens. When you're worrying, your mind is divided between faith and unbelief. You're trying to wrestle these two. And see where you begin, between positive thoughts and negative thoughts. And you're wrestling between the two. That's what worry is. And you are just destroying yourself. (laughs) Don't allow that to happen. Bitterness and unforgiveness robs us of peace. They create a restlessness and serve only to redefine our purpose. That's exactly what it does. When you are holding on to something and you become so bitter, you know, you're changing your purpose. You're redefining it. How so? If God tells us to forgive someone, and that's his purpose, so by forgiving someone, you can now move on and pursue what God has for you. When you are filled with bitter and unforgiveness, it repurposes you. Your thought is getting even with that person. Your thought is, I'm not going to allow that person to talk to my family or allow that person to come into my home or anything else. And you just feel that bitterness, and it changes not just your purpose, it changes you as a person. Always, always will. Now, if that's biblical peace, these are the benefits of biblical peace. When Jesus said, peace I give you, this is the peace he meant. So then, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? It has very little to do with what the world says. The world says, you want peace in your old age? Well, then you know you need to have a good 501k plan. If you want peace, you need to make your money now. Do what you have to do. Take the shortcuts. Get ahead, make the money, then you can retire and be the Christian that you want to be. And then there's some people that have those thoughts. Yeah, you know what? They do whatever so they can lie, cheat, commit character assassination so they can jump ahead, get the jobs, and they have no problem coming into church. That's not peace. Because in the end, you may be thinking that you're enjoying the money and the 
your retirement. But I guarantee you, you will be thinking about the people that you had to mow over to get it. And you will not have that peace in retirement. Be careful. Being a peacemaker then, quite simply, is being someone who makes peace. But not the world, God's peace. So being a peacemaker is first understanding that you are called to it. Every one of us are called to being a peacemaker. Colossians 3.15 says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were what? Called to peace. You were called to peace. You are called to be a peacemaker. In 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says this, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is peace in relationships. Peace with God. In Romans 12, 18, it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And listen, it says, if it is possible. Let's face it. I mean, there have been people in my lives, I'm sure you've come across that. It didn't matter what I said. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter what I tried to do to make things right. They didn't want to hear it. I could only do what is possible to do within me. As far as it's responsible, I, I had to discharge my responsibility as a peacemaker to do that very thing. If they didn't want to hear it, I can't be responsible for their choices. And you can't be responsible for other people's choices. You can and you will be responsible for your choice to be a peacemaker, to do what you can to live at peace with everyone. This is why we're called to be at peace, to be the peacemakers. Two, being a peacemaker is not being passive. It is something active. You can't call yourself a peacemaker and then just live a passive life and think that you're a peacemaker. See, a peacemaker is someone who makes peace. It's not just staying out of the way of everybody. It is going and being forthright and going out and making peace. When you see something, yes, you can interject. And number one is helping people as an evangelist to discharge your duty as an evangelist. That's for every one of us. That you're going around and you're going to be a peacemaker? How? You're helping them to have peace with God, making things right. That's, you know, think about that. As soon as someone accepts the Lord Jesus, as soon as they give up what they may have been holding on to, they are now at rest with God. At least on their deathbed, they're not fighting him. How important is that? It's why when I do visit people in a hospital or visit them in a home, if I know they're on hospice or things like that, I know the end is coming close, I will ask them, have they made their peace with God? I may have to explain that, and that's okay. But I need them to think about what that means. Because even if they say, yes, I will go out, and I will say, you know, through Jesus Christ. You know, and I will explain that as well. What I mean by that. Being a peacemaker, and this is so important, it's not about compromising your values, morality, or the gospel. Sometimes we feel that we have to, in order to have peace, that we need to compromise. And that is not what it's about. I've seen this. The struggle, I mean, you know, it's a family that doesn't really matter what the kids listen to or watch on TV. See, because to say something may cause friction, and you know what, I just want peace in the household. That's not peace. By giving in on morality and giving in on those things that you know is right for your children, that's not peace. That's a compromise of value, and that's not what God has ever wanted you to do. 
At times, being a peacemaker can be violent. I just want that to sink in. It can be violent. And that seems to be so contradictory to a peacemaker. Let me explain what I mean by that. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says this. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. I mean, pierced, crushed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Pierced, crushed, punished, wounded. That is not someone that didn't go into battle. That is someone that was willing to give his life, and it was violent. But for our sake, he brought peace. The violence that was shown him, you think about it, you don't have to, you don't have to go any further than the cross to see the violence that brings peace. And there's going to be times like a sheep before its shears is silent, that you too will have to remain silent and take the abuse so that it may be, bring peace to maybe your children, maybe to the neighborhood, maybe to the cities, the government, the schools, wherever. It is not taking up arms and being like the world. It is living by God's values and what he says is right. In Romans 16, 20, it says this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now that's pretty violent, right? The God of peace is gonna crush and we don't put those things together too often. But God is constantly fighting because you see, you can't have a compromise with the enemy. The devil, you can't compromise with the devil saying, you know what, I need peace in my household. I need peace in my whatever it might be. By compromising with the devil, no. God knows the only way you're gonna have true peace is by crushing the devil under your feet so that you may have it. There's no, there's no like, hey, wow, you know, let's just play this game. That's why we said before, a long time ago, and I say this every once in a while, there's no way that a Christian can be possessed by a demon and the Holy Spirit. The demon's getting crushed before he ever comes close to you. Because it's not how it plays. God doesn't play those games. A house divided against itself will not stand. God doesn't play games with your soul. The devil might, and we might, but God will not. Matthew 10, 34 30 through 36, Jesus says this, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he explains himself, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Wow, you talk about bringing a sword even into their own family. And for the mature in Christ, you know what I'm talking about and what Jesus meant by that is that whenever you speak the good news of Jesus Christ. What is it? It's a double, the word of God is what? A double-edged sword. This is what happens. That's the sword. So when you talk about the gospel of peace, you could say it as kind as you want. You can try to not step on too many toes, but if someone doesn't want to hear it, and someone wants to say, who are you to tell me how to live my life? I'm not, tr I'm not the one saying this now, it, it's, it's from the gospel. Don't tell me, I don't want anything to do with it. All of a sudden it creates that friction in the home because someone wants to live their own life to do their own thing. This is what Jesus was talking about. 
And then he ends with the promise, as all Beatitudes end with a promise. Blessed are the peacemakers, which you were called to, and you are. For they will be called sons of God. You know, I, I thought about this a lot. See, you're not just going to see God. You're going to be considered a son of God. And I thought about why here? Why do the peacemakers get to be a son of God and maybe not the righteous? You know, for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will what? See God. But why are the pure, right? We'll see God. You know, you know, those who hunger and thirst, they will be filled. The pure at heart, they will see God. Why not pure at heart be considered a son of God? I think it's because of the attributes that's here. Think about this. Being a peacemaker shows the heart of God, which is at the root core, reconciliation. While we were yet enemies, Romans 5 says, while we were yet enemies of God, he came. He forgave us. He sent his son to be brutally beaten so that we may have peace. And the only way to have that peace is to be reconciled with God. And so the peacemakers are considered sons of God because they portray the character of God, the actions of God, who he himself is the chief peacemaker, the peacemaker of our souls, See, he's concerned with relationships. For they will be called sons of God. You know, Jonathan, growing up in our home, you know, our son, he, uh, he go to a sleepover, go stay at someone's home, he'd go just do whatever, just trying to be a kid. Always went with the label, pastor's kid. This is pastor's son. This is... Pastor Mike and Kathy's son, this is it's just the way it was. And whether rightly or wrongly, there were certain expectations of him. Some of them were good. And do we have to? Is you'd have to teach any child to change the ways? Yes. Does it bring you have to bring discipline sometimes? Yes. Some of them were just unrealistic. You know, I mean, because the kid is just a kid. I mean, you can't put certain things upon a kid. That's just being unrealistic there. And so we have to be careful. But in the end, he was always considered pastor's son. And with that came those expectations. Do you know there's certain expectations that come with us? Because we're supposed to give the character of God to everyone we see. We're supposed to reveal that. We're supposed to show that. So when you call yourself a Christian, you need to be a peacemaker. You need to be a peacemaker. Isaiah 57 verse 2 says this, Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. In James 3.18 Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. A harvest of righteousness. Souls. Character. That's a harvest. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. That is is one of your callings. And that is who you are. So when the world can seem to like it's going crazy, maybe even your own home or your own school or whatever else may seem like it's going crazy out there, you can have the peace of God. And by having the peace of God in your life, you will be the peacemaker and show others how they can live at peace as well. True peace.
that comes from within and not from without. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord God, for what you are doing. Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you would minister to each and every one that's here today, Lord God. Father, you know if we are here and we've been struggling and fighting you, there can't be peace in our lives. There can't be peace in the home. There can't be peace wherever we go because we are not at peace with you. It begins first and foremost with you before we can ever be considered as a peacemaker. So Father, we pray right now, Lord God, that for those who are within the sound of my voice, that if you feel yourself have been struggling and fighting against God, that you're waking up at night, maybe you find yourself hiding something from others, God is saying, make peace with me today and watch you get a good night's sleep tonight. Why hold on to those things? It hasn't been working for you. Guaranteed, it has not been working for you this far. So let it go and accept God's path for your life. How do you do that? By accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sin, and accepting his salvation. And if you're here like that today, and you're saying, Pastor, I want peace with God, then I'm going to ask you, would you just pray a short prayer with me? You could use your own words. That is fine. There's no magic in the words that I'll ask you to follow me. All I'm saying is, <laughs> mean it from the heart. Would you just join with me in prayer? Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, thank you for the peace that you came to offer through your Son, Jesus Christ. Not like the world gives, but peace that only Jesus can give. And so I repent of my sins and of all my wrongdoings, and I ask for your forgiveness. And right now, I ask Jesus to come into my life as my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer or something like it and meant it, don't believe anything else other than the word. You have peace with God. You may have to make restitution. You may have to do certain things. I don't know where your life may be, but you're on the path of peace. And you can truly be a peacemaker yourself. As our worship team leads us in song, I want to leave these altars open. Your chair at home, you can, wherever it may be, but if you, you know yourself that there's a way within you that you just need to just make right before God, you know if you want to be a true peacemaker, sowing the gospel of peace in others' lives, you know all about that. So I'm only asking right now, let's wrestle with those issues. We've got time. Let's wrestle with them now because God wants us to. There's no sense. If you're wrestling right now, if you feel an uneasiness, if you feel a check in your spirit, a restlessness, that's not peace. That's just the opposite. Then let me encourage you. Go before God today. You can come up here for whatever you want and we'll pray with you. You can make your chair your area of peace, whatever it might be. But let's seek God right now. For those who may have made a decision, whether you're online or here, all those online you'll see a uh, web address please fill out that form. We want to get you a Bible if you need one. We have Bible material here as well. See me at this altar if you've made that choice, if you just want prayer. Nothing worth more that 
I could ever come.